You're listening to The Frequency of Creativity with Melinda Har Curley. Welcome everyone to The Frequency of Creativity, where we are at the intersection of energy and art. I'm your host, Melinda Har Curley, and to see how art can energize your space and your life, sign up for my newsletter at Melinda parcurly.com. Today, I'm really excited to talk with the multimedia artist and, excuse me, Anne Tarantino, and we'll be talking about the unique language of public art. Welcome, Anne. Hi, Melinda. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for being on the podcast. Your website, and I encourage all the listeners to go to it, is so interesting because, and it's so impressive because you have a number of public art installations and they're all very diverse and they all seem so specific to where they are installed. But let's first start with, Anne, what is public art? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, that's such a great question. Um, I would define a public art as any artwork that exists in a civic space. Um, so that could be anything from a park to um, an office building to a city street uh, to a mural that you might see on the side of a building. Essentially, anything that exists outside of that rarefied world of galleries and museums. And then, Anne, like what drew you to these large scale installations? Like what made you so interested in this? Yeah, so I um, would start by just giving a little sense of my background. So I'm trained as a painter. Um, I studied painting both as an undergrad and then as a graduate student. So I have an MFA in drawing and painting. And so that is how I enter into um, art making in in general. Um, So for many years, I was not working in the public realm at all and kind of didn't even really know that that was a thing or that that existed. Um, The catalyst for me to start making work for the public realm actually was the um, birth of my twins in 2010. Um, I, had this kind of reckoning um, when they were, they were born prematurely and I was home with them and caring for them. And suddenly it felt not especially meaningful to be um, only making these paintings that were these kind of um, delicate objects that could get, they could get damaged or if there was a ding on a drawing, I would sort of panic. I, I, you know, it's, it's no longer, Um, whole or complete. And I was nervous about having the kids in my studio. And I thought, well, this is kind of crazy. This, you know, it doesn't have to be like this. Is there a way that I can translate what I do into spaces that are open, not just to my family, but to other families, to diverse audiences? Uh, So that was really the the spark for me. Mm -hmm. And that is so interesting. And as a painter who obsesses over paintings and if yeah, there's yeah. a little thing, um, <laughs> that is really interesting. And I love how you really expanded your perception or, or perceptive and just included not only your family, but expanded out to the general public as well. Mm-hmm. And I'm so sorry, we're going to have to go to a short break. But before we do, can you share with listeners where they can find you? Yes, absolutely. My website is antarantino.com. That's A-N-N-T-A-R-A-N-T-I-N-O.com. And my Instagram is at antarantino. Okay. Well, please stay with us as we find out so much more about the unique language of public art and talk so much more deeply with Anne. Stay with us. We're back 
with the frequency of creativity where we are at the intersection of energy and art. We're talking with multimedia artist Anne Tarantino. And your website really is one of the more interesting websites I've gone on because you have such a depth of information um, on your website. And whenever I read it, I could tell that you have fully thought through your installations and there's a, such a deep meaning to them. And on your uh, website, you say public art represents the lives and memories of the people who move within such spaces and the patterns and imprints we leave upon and learn from the world around us are revealed. And what do you mean by this? Yeah, so this kind of goes back to your earlier mention of site specificity or work that is in dialogue with the place where it's installed, um, which is really important to me. I think that the, the best public art does strive to create that kind of relationship with the community that's going to see it, to quote, use it. Um, and hopefully invite repeat viewing. And I, I think um, in my experience, a great way to do that is to essentially design the work in dialogue, not only with the space, but also with the greater community. So I, I mean, certainly you could plunk a sculpture down anywhere or, or a mural or um, what have you, and uh, it might look great. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that the most meaningful experiences are created when there's attention paid to that intersection between the, the community or some kind of engagement component. So I work to, to do that um, in my projects. I would say that in recent years, my practice has moved uh, much back toward painting. Um, initially, my work was more sculptural and I was kind of feeling out what it meant to work in the public realm. Um, recently, I've been making murals, uh, large scale paintings or site specific paintings and things of that nature. Um, and I generally invite input from audiences into the content of those, um, whether it's just saying to uh, the client, for lack of a better word, um, you, you know, what, what, what would you like to represent? What are your goals with this piece? Um, this was the case recently with a, a large mural I did for the borough of State College. They wanted to reinforce their efforts to create a welcoming and inclusive community. And so I will work backwards from keywords like that if someone's able to provide those and, um, then work to translate that kind of through the lens of what I might see when I think of those words. Um, so I hope that answers your question. That's one way to work toward having the, the ultimate artwork be um, reflective of as opposed to alienating to or distance from the audience. So that's what I mean by like the imprints of people who, who would see the piece. And I think that's very clear. And, and looking at your website, one, it, many installations are there, but one that really struck me is uh, the Diamond District mm. in New York City. And I love walking down that street. And whenever I'm in New York, I, I yeah. love, like, it, it, I just love that street, mm -hmm. the energy oh, of it. Great. And then you did a mural, and I believe it's called Jump Cuts. Yes. And visually, it's on vacant storefront windows. Mm -hmm. And visually, there are all of these jagged intersecting lines. And it reminded me of a cut diamond yes. and all the yes. refractions from a cut yes. diamond. Yes. Oh, I, I'm so glad you like that piece. That was really fun to do. And that is exactly what I was striving for. That's kind of, and that's a great example of thinking like, how can you sort of pull information or history from the site or from the place and think like, what happens in this place, you know, and maybe that is 
reflected in a piece that could be read as kind of a pleasant abstraction, but also could be read as having a little more content. Um, so I love that you picked up on that kind of the facets of, of diamonds. Um, that, 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 that project is interesting for me because that was a piece that was almost like a segue back into painting or two dimensions. Um, I was working with vinyl directly on those windows, but it does very much function as a mural. It, it could you know, also feel just like a big, it, it is, I, I think of it as a mural. So I appreciate it that you refer to it as such, um, but it also relies on light. So it's backlit. Um, so that that kind of illuminates the, the piece. And so it sort of sits at this interesting intersection between two and three dimensions. Yeah, and in that mural, you, in my opinion, you perfectly reflected the oh, environment thank you. that it's in. And oh, thank I just, you. I just really smiled when I saw that. Um, on your website, you also say, the diligent act of map making is mimicked in my process. So Anne, how does map making relate to your installations? Yes, um, so I think a lot, I, in, in recent years, I would say, um, I have thought a lot about um, place, uh, a sense of place, how place can inform our work um, and, I have referred a lot to maps as source material, um, topography of various landscapes, but also started to, uh, I, I started to think about my work as kind of this like exploded landscape painting in a way. Um, in recent years, you know, I would look kind of at both the natural worlds, but also the built environment and start to see these kind of shapes and forms, a lot of geometrics, but then also sort of intersected by like natural forms that you might see outside. Um, so I started to translate a lot of those forms and shapes into my work. Um, I would like draw some of these shapes, cut them out. Sometimes I would laser cut the pieces, use those as stencils, but then also, um, I would etch, uh, I would make drawings and then translate them into digital drawings and etch those into the surfaces of paintings on, on panel. Um, and the drawings were often pulled from, pulled from maps. So either places that I had been, places that are embedded in my history, both my personal and artistic history. Um, I spent the majority of my life before coming to Pennsylvania. I lived in New England and was never more than probably a half an hour from a open water. Um, and so moving to a landlocked state, I became really interested in and fascinated by just the undulations of the landscape and how it registered for me being away from, from water. Um, as, as an adult, I have lived in various places around the world. I spent a couple of years um, living in Japan. I um, had a grant that took me back and forth from Brazil. Uh, and so I just, I thought a lot about all these places and how we are all maps really, you know, kind of of the places that we've been. Um, and so I had been working to bring that into my work in ways that are both um, aesthetic and visual, but also conceptual. And so in listening to you in your diverse experience of being exposed to the Japanese culture, being mm -hmm. exposed to the culture in Brazil, mm -hmm. and, another, and this may or may not relate, and if it mm -hmm. doesn't, please tell me, but also, on your website, I noticed in New York City that you painted concrete traffic barriers. Mm -hmm. So this, and I get it could be seen as a mural, is totally. mm -hmm. 400 feet long by three feet in height. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking, there are so many geometric patterns yeah. on this, and it is definitely a part of the environment and landscape yeah. and a very important part. And then you call it razzle dazzle 
because of a certain history in New York. Yeah, so that was a really fun project. And I would say that was probably that was my first large scale mural, like public mural um, for the New York City Department of Transit. Um, the barriers were to um, demarcate a new bicycle lane that runs underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. And my design proposal was to pull from Dazzle Camouflage, which you or listeners might be familiar with. It's um, uh, these kind of crazy patterns that were painted on um, ships during World War II to supposedly confuse uh, enemy ships, you know, so that they would create this kind of disruption of sight and that people wouldn't know what to make of them or where they, where they were going or, or what they were. And um, so I loved that idea of like these big paintings that were literally floating and moving across the water. I just thought it was so amazing. Um, so I drew some of those, drew inspiration from the patterns, um, from the palette as well, some of the colors of Dazzle Camouflage and came up with this kind of remixed um, contemporary vision of, of what that could be. Um, and you're absolutely right that, I mean, that, that piece literally just by nature of what it's painted on, it undulates throughout the, the landscape. So it really is, it becomes almost an architectural um, element in a way. Oh, it absolutely mm -hmm. does. And then as we, and I may be repeating a little bit here, but when you go on your website, it seems like the main point that you make on your website is, and I quote, investigating the impact of human behavior and geography on architectural and natural landscapes through drawing, painting, installation, and public art. My work directly engages viewers in a dialogue concerning the nuances of contemporary life in response to space, time, culture, and materiality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny to hear that read out loud. It feels a little wordy, <laughs> but maybe I can paraphrase. Um, uh, I think that, um, and stop me if, if this isn't answering the question, um, but you know, my, my hearing that it's interesting to hear like words that, that you write and hearing that, I think, um, I, I've always been interested in sort of, uh, like imprints or residue or patina, um, kind of leftover little marks that might not be, um, monumental, but that show histories of where people have been. Um, and so, for example, living in Brazil, I was struck by how colorful so many of the buildings were in Sao Paulo, but it, it, it might, you know, like, um, it's a big city, lots of concrete, but you would have little houses or little storefronts that someone had painted bright blue or pink or, um, you know, some of them were multicolored and somebody then might come along and like paint over it and you could see some of the history um, as well as like the new layer. I remember in graduate school having a professor who used to come into the studios and say, your palettes are the most interesting thing in here. You know, Pat, and you would appreciate this given the nature of your work. Like she would always say, I want the painting to look as fresh as those, all those marks and sort of like the erasing and the history of the paint that's on the palette, mm -hmm. which really struck me. Um, I think of, you know, a line across a landscape, um, they're called desire lines. I learned this when teaching in landscape architecture department where, you know, let's say the path goes, like this is the sidewalk maybe, but people wanna go this way. And so they just cut across the grass and ultimately there's um, kind of a line that is imprinted in, in the grass. And you can almost see the people who, who did that, you know, it's like um, literally voting with your feet. I always found that so interesting. <laughs> so um, those are the little moments that uh, I find myself interested in observing and capturing and translating in my work. Well, and I think that leads directly into another installation called Watermark. Mm. So um, it's in a riverfront park, 
and you paint a straight line that's a mile long and that you also include video and audio portions that mimic the effects of water. And in this town of Millvale, the water is such an important part mm -hmm. of the town itself and the history. Yes, um, that was kind of a breakthrough project for me. Um, I started working on it uh, when I was in Brazil. So I think the project was up maybe 2017 to 2018. It was kind of a multi-part um, project and it was in collaboration with the borough of Millvale, um, as you say, which is almost like a little, it's like a little chunk out of Pittsburgh, <laughs> kind of across the river from Lawrenceville, if, if you can picture that. Um, and um, the content for it emerged from engagement with the community. What did people want to see? What would be meaningful? You know, kind of what, what was their story? Trying to figure that out. Um, and that community had had a devastating flood um, not so many years ago um, from a um, Gertie's run. It was called a body of water that runs right through town, but they also were cut off from the Pittsburgh riverfront by a, a five lane highway. So it was this kind of funny thing where there was water and sometimes too much water, but then hard to access water at the same time. Um, so I, with that project, um, what I gleaned from speaking with community members was that there was interest in healing from, from this flood um, and kind of rethinking that, but also ways of wayfinding, you know, so using painting, and it wasn't until later that I actually thought of that as a painting. It is a mural of sorts. It is this kind of straight line. It's sort of geometric. It sort of zigzags from the waterfront across the traffic. So it's on the medians, it's on you know, walls um, of underpasses um, and culminates in a public park where there was a video installation with these uh, water sounds um, that would play starting at nightfall um, until, until morning. So it was, um, the I would say the last big project I, I did that incorporated more, not sculptural per se, but time-based in, in a way with audio and, and video. Um, but uh, it still feels like a painting to me in many ways. You make me want to go there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so earlier, um, you, you, well, you've talked throughout um, our conversation about your painting and that you also do collage work and work on paper. Mm -hmm. So you say on your website um, that your um, collage work are exercises in the layered nuances of world building, granting insight into our active role in shaping the environment. Mm. And how is this reflected in like your laser cut paper, your collage work? Yeah, um, yes. So that's a great question. And I have been working over the course of the last couple of years of trying to like answer that question in my work. <laughs> and when I write about and talk about my work, sort of figuring out how do these different pieces fit together? I think as an artist who works across a couple of different domains, it can sometimes be a challenge to um, communicate how all that work ties together. Um, and for me, the common thread across the collage, across um, some of the installation and then the painting and now the murals um, has been that they all build from like the, the visual language of topography. We were talking earlier about map making and these kind of linear drawings. So, um, I started to both etch some of that source material into the um, surfaces of these paintings on panel, but also to actually laser cut out some of the shapes um, that I was drawing and drawing initially by hand. So I know it's, it's like this sort of multi-layered process. It goes from hand to machine, back to hand. Um, 
And frequently those shapes would be of things like um, flowers or um, kind of starting from like uh, vegetation, plant material, shells, um, also marks in the landscape, you know, kind of ripples of sand and um, cracks in the sidewalk, you know, kind of uh, things like this. So again, so evidence of what exists, but also what exists because of us and our bodies and how we move through space. Um, and the pieces that um, I would cut out these forms either out of paper or masonite or chipboard, something like that, and either use them as part of a collage, um, or I would use them as a stencil for a drawing or a painting. So I would then airbrush over them. So there's a lot of echoes and back and forth, uh, a lot of recycling of the pieces, you know, so mm -hmm. I might use a stencil and it's covered in these layers of paint and I love the way it looks and I think, okay, this is like the perfect shade of purple and I'm going to repurpose this into this drawing. And you're just so interdimensional <laughs> and you're drawing on so many different forms, materials, um, your personal work, the outside environment. It's just so fascinating to me how you can draw all of these, literally draw all of these disparate parts into this unified whole that's able to exist in an environment in a very public way that seems so organic to mm. that area. So mm -hmm. congratulations. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to hear that. I'm so glad you enjoy the work. I really do. And another one in listening to you talk to and going back to your laser cut paper and another installation and the title, help me if I'm mispronouncing, is it Topo Analysis? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that it was in New York and mm -hmm. it's a building that's on the high line and you put laser cut paper mm -hmm. on the windows so that there's no seeming barrier between the external and the internal. Yes. Oh, I love that um, interpretation. Yeah, that's um, that that piece. I don't remember when the High Line opened to the public. Um, you know, after the kind of renova renovation, but probably it was a year or two before that time, maybe. And I was. Um, struck by the location of the gallery um, just off of the like 26th street stairs where you can climb up and get on the high line. And I had been reading, um, I read one of the landscape architects who had worked on the high line described it as a self seated landscape. Like it had just kind of, you know, it had been left to just bloom and live and die and, you know, kind of everything in between and had sort of seated itself. Um, so I loved the idea that um, the landscape could almost jump the fence, you know, and start to populate the buildings nearby. Um, so that piece, as I think of it, is not dissimilar from jump cuts in that it's activated by light um, and reads differently during the day, of course, than, than it would at night. Um, that piece was built from, as you say, laser cut paper drawings of some of the native plants that I researched what were the plants that were growing at the High Line kind of prior to it being renovated and rehabilitated and um, made drawings of those, translated those into digital drawings and then cut those out. Um, and so um, it was quite large. Uh, it was a, a series of um, large kind of second floor storefront windows. And as I think of it, I used sort of harvested a lot of those pieces for later projects as well. You know, that was a piece that kind of once it came down and it had lived its life, it could live another life somewhere else. Mm. And, and in closing, um, you were featured in New American Paintings uh, you were a recipient of a Fulbright Core Scholar Award for Artistic Practice in Brazil. You earned an honors degree in visual arts from Brown 
And as you said earlier, you get a master's of fine arts with a concentrating in painting from Penn State. In listening to this conversation, your installations, your work, your painting, there's such a depth of analysis of it. Hmm. How did your formal training how does that relate to where you are now in your art career? Yeah, I, I love that question. Um, and um, you picked up on something that I'm not sure I really, you know, had thought of um, until now, but, you know, one of the interesting things about my undergraduate experience was that I um, I did not come to art making until probably the second semester of my sophomore year of college. I had always been a creative um, kid and was interested in making things, but really didn't know anything about possibilities for art as a vocation. Um, and I happened to get into an introductory drawing course. Um, from there, took painting one and just fell in love with it and was like full speed ahead. You know, this is this is what I'm gonna do. And it sort of like clicked for me like that. Um, the focus at Brown was much more on starting with ideas as opposed to like, you know, well, the flash forward, you know, as a graduate student, I'm at Penn State and I'm teaching things like life drawing, you know, or how to draw the figure or drawing still life or things like that. And my education was actually flipped. Like I kind of started from uh, what is this painting about as opposed to what technical strategies do I know how to use? So that was sort of a trial by fire entry into being an artist. It was like, well, what's your content? You know, what, what is this about? So I think I had a lot of experience in those early days trying to articulate those ideas of what a painting could be, um, and then came to some of the technical pieces later. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting in, in, in that way. Um, I was fortunate as a graduate student to work with faculty who really challenged me, um, pushed me to work bigger, um, to make a lot of mistakes, ask a lot of questions. Um, and at the same time, I mean, I had fabulous experiences as a student, both undergrad and graduate school, but I think really nothing prepares you for um, uh, like the living as, as an artist, you know, figuring out sort of the entrepreneurial piece, the sort of life piece, you know, how do you make your practice sustainable, both financially, also psychologically, you know, kind of how, how do you make this work as a creative person? So I, I would say probably equal parts school and, and life, <laughs> and I'm still figuring it out how to make it all work. And I think we all are. Yeah. And, and in listening to you, your, and I've said this to other guests on the podcast as well, and just even how you came to public installations when your twins were born, your work is not separate from who you are. Mm. Your life seems like your mm -hmm. work and your life mm -hmm. reflects your work or your work reflects your life. Either mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. you're taking many different parts and unifying them into a cohesive whole. In your work, that's obviously what you're doing. And in your life, it seems that's what you're doing as well. And art is an integral part of your life and who you are and your family mm -hmm. life as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And thank you so much for being with us. This really was a very fascinating and interesting conversation. And I'm glad that we were able to draw listeners' attention and hopefully um, listeners, the next time you're looking at public art, you'll take like a minute and just, you know, look at it and appreciate all the work that goes into it and that how it becomes an organic structure to the environment itself if it's done well like a Tarantino installation and before um, we leave can you share with listeners one more time where they can find you 
Sure, Melinda, and thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. My website is antarantino.com. There's no E's in there. It's A-N-N-T-A-R-A-N-T-I-N-O.com. And my Instagram is at antarantino. Come find me. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you listeners for being with us on the frequency of creativity, where we are at the intersection of energy and art to see how art can energize your space and your life, sign up for my newsletter at melindaparcurly.com. So today, we hope that you enjoy the unique language of public art.